1601 by Mark Twain. Introduction. Born irreverent, scrawled Mark Twain on a scratch pad. Like all other people I have ever known or heard of, I am hoping to remain so while there are any reverent irreverences left to make fun of. Mark Twain was just as irreverent as he dared be, and 1601 reveals his richest expression of sovereign contempt for overstuffed language. Genteel literature and conventional idiocies. Later, when a magazine editor apostrophized, Oh, that we had a Rayblay, Mark impishly and anonymously submitted 1601. And that same editor, a praiser of Rayblay, scathingly abused it and the sender. In this episode, as in many others, Mark Twain, the bad boy of American literature, revealed his huge delight in blasting the shams of contemporary hypocrisy. 2. There was always the spirit of Tom Sawyer deviltry in Mark's make-up that prompted him, as he himself boasted, to see how much holy indignation he could stir up in the world. Who wrote 1601? The correct and complete title of 1601, as first issued, was Conversation, as it was by the social fireside. In the time of the Tudors, for many years after its anonymous first issue in 1880, its authorship was variously conjectured and widely disputed. In Boston, William T. Ball, one of the leading theatrical critics during the late 90s asserted that it was originally written by an English actor named Not Divulged who gave it to him. Ball's original, it was said, looked like a newspaper strip in the way it was printed, and may indeed have been a proof pulled in some newspaper office. In St. Louis, William Marion Reedy, editor of the St. Louis Mirror, had seen this famous tour de force circulated in the early 80s in galley-proof form. He first learned from Eugene Field that it was from the pen of Mark Twain. Many people, said Reedy, thought the thing was done by Field and attributed as a joke to Mark Twain. Field had a perfect genius for that sort of thing, as many extant specimens attest, and for that sort of practical joke. But, to my thinking, the humor of the piece is too mellow, not hard and bright and bitter to be Eugene Field's. Reedy's opinion hits off the fundamental difference between these two great humorists. One half suspects that Reedy was thinking of Field's French crisis. But Twain first claimed his bantling from the fog of anonymity in 1906, in a letter addressed to Mr. Charles Orr, librarian of Case Library, Cleveland, said Clemens in the course of his letter dated July 30, 1906, from Dublin, New Hampshire. The title of the piece is 1601. The piece is a supposititious conversation, which takes place in Queen Elizabeth's closet in that year. Between the Queen, Ben Johnson, Beaumont, Sir Walter Raleigh, the Duchess of Bilgewater, and one or two others. And is not, as John Hay mistakenly supposes, a serious effort to bring back our literature and philosophy to the sober and chaste Elizabeth's time. If there is a decent word findable in it, it is because I overlooked it. I hasten to assure you that it is not printed in my published writings. Twitting the Reverend Joseph Twitchell the circumstances of how 1601 came to be written have since been officially revealed by Albert Bigelow Payne in Mark Twain. A Bibliography 1912, 
and in the publication of Mark Twain's Notebook, 1935. 1601 was written during the summer of 1876, when the Clemens family had retreated to Quarry Farm in Elmira County. New York. Here Mrs. Clemens enjoyed relief from social obligations. The children romped over the countryside. And Mark retired to his octagonal study, which, perched high on the hill, looked out upon the valley below. It was in the famous summer of 1876, too, that Mark was putting the finishing touches to Tom Sawyer. Before the close of the same year, he had already begun work on The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, published in 1885. It is interesting to note the use of the title, The Duke of Bilgewater, in Huck Finn when the Duchess of Bilgewater had already made her appearance in 1601. Sandwiched between his two great masterpieces, Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, the writing of 1601 was indeed a strange interlude. During this prolific period, Mark wrote many minor items, most of them rejected by Howells, and read extensively in one of his favorite books. Pepe's Diary, like many another writer, Mark was captivated by Pepe's style and spirit, and he determined says Albert Bigelow Payne in his Mark Twain, a biography, to try his hand on an imaginary record of conversation and court manners of a bygone day. Written in the phrase of the period, the result was fireside conversation in the time of Queen Elizabeth, or, as he later called it, 1601. The conversation recorded by a supposed Pepys of that period was written with all the outspoken coarseness and nakedness of that rank day. When fireside sociabilities were limited only to the loosened fancy vocabulary and physical performance, and not by any bounds of convention, it was written as a letter continues pain to that robust divine Reverend Joseph Twitchell, who, unlike Howells, had no scruples about Mark's Elizabethan breadth of parlance. The Reverend Joseph Twitchell, Mark's most intimate friend for over forty years, was pastor of the Asylum Hill Congregational Church of Hartford, which Mark facetiously called the Church of the Holy Speculators because of its wealthy parishioners. Here Mark had first met Joe at a social, and their meeting ripened into a glorious, lifelong friendship. Twitchell was a man of about Mark's own age, a profound scholar, a devout Christian, yet a man with an exuberant sense of humor, and a profound understanding of the frailties of mankind. The Reverend Mr. Twitchell performed the marriage ceremony for Mark Twain and solemnized the births of his children. Joe, his friend, counseled him on literary, as well as personal matters, for the remainder of Mark's life. It is important to catch this brief glimpse of the man for whom this masterpiece was written, for without it one cannot fully understand the spirit in which 1601 was written, or the keen enjoyment which Mark and Joe derived from it. Save Me One The story of the first issue of 1601 is one of finesse state diplomacy and surreptitious printing. The Reverend Joe Twitchell, for whose delectation the piece had been written, apparently had pocketed the document for four long years. Then, in 1880, it came into the hands of John Hay, later Secretary of State, presumably sent to him by Mark Twain. Hay pronounced the sketch a masterpiece, 
and wrote immediately to his old Cleveland friend, Alexander Gunn. Prince of Connoisseurs in Art and Literature The following correspondence reveals the fine diplomacy which made the name of John Hay known throughout the world. Department of State, Washington, June 21, 1880, Dear Gunn, Are you in Cleveland for all this week? If you will say yes by return mail, I have a masterpiece to submit to your consideration, which is only in my hands for a few days. Yours very much warranted by the depravity of Christendom. Hey. The second letter discloses Hay's own high opinion of the effort and his deep concern for its safety. June 24, 1880, My Dear Gunn, Here it is. It was written by Mark Twain in a serious effort to bring back our literature and philosophy to the sober and chaste Elizabethan standard. But the taste of the present day is too corrupt for anything so classic. He has not yet been able even to find a publisher. The Globe has not yet recovered from Downey's inroad. And they won't touch it. I send it to you as one of the few lingering relics of that race of appreciative critics. Who know a good thing when they see it. Read it with reverence and gratitude, and send it back to me. For Mark is impatient to see once more his wandering offspring. Yours, Hay. In his third letter one can almost hear Hay's chuckle in the certainty that his diplomatic, if somewhat wicked, suggestion would bear fruit. Washington, D. C. July 7, 1880, my dear gun, I have your letter and the proposition which you make to pull a few proofs of the masterpiece is highly attractive. And of course highly immoral. I cannot properly consent to it, and I am afraid the great many would think I was taking an unfair advantage of his confidence. Please send back the document as soon as you can, and if, in spite of my prohibition, you take these proofs, Save me one. Very truly yours, John Hay. Thus was this Elizabethan dialogue poured into the molds of cold type. According to Merle Johnson, Mark Twain's bibliographer, it was issued in pamphlet form, without wrappers or covers. There were eight pages of text, and the pamphlet measured seven by eight one slash two inches. Only four copies are believed to have been printed, one for Hay, one for Gunn, and two for Twain. In the matter of humor, wrote Clemens, referring to Hay's delicious notes, what an unsurpassable touch John Hay had. Humor at West Point. The first printing of 1601 in actual book form was done at Ye Academy Press in 1882. West Point, New York, under the supervision of Lute. C. E. S. Wood, then adjutant of the U.S. Military Academy. In 1882, Mark Twain and Joe Twitchell visited their friend Lute. Wood at West Point, where they learned that Wood, as adjutant, had under his control a small printing establishment. On Mark's return to Hartford, Wood received a letter asking if he would do Mark a great favor by printing something he had written, which he did not care to entrust to the ordinary printer. Wood replied that he would be glad to oblige. On April 3, 1882, Mark sent the manuscript. I enclose the original of 1603 as you suggest. I am afraid there are errors in it, also, 
Heedlessness in antiquated spelling is stuck on often at end of words where they are not strictly necessary, etc. I would go through the manuscript, but I am too much driven just now, and it is not important anyway. I wish you would do me the kindness to make any and all corrections that suggest themselves to you. Sincerely yours, S. L. Clemens. Charles Erskine Scott would recall in a foreword, which he wrote for the limited edition of 1601 issued by the Grabhorn Press, how he felt when he first saw the original manuscript. When I read it, writes Wood, I felt that the character of it would be carried a little better by a printing which pretended to the eye that it was contemporaneous with the pretended conversation. I wrote Mark that for literary effect I thought there should be a species of forgery, though, of course, there was no effort to actually deceive a scholar. Mark answered that I might do as I liked, that his only object was to secure a number of copies, as the demand for it was becoming burdensome. But he would be very grateful for any interest I brought to the doing. Well, Tucker and I soaked some handmade linen paper in weak coffee, put it as a wet bundle into a warm room to mildew, dried it to a dampness approved by Tucker, and he printed the copy on a hand press. I had special punches cut for such Elizabethan abbreviations as the A, E, O, and U, when followed by M or N, and for the commonly and stupidly pronounced Y. The only editing I did was as to the spelling, and a few old English words introduced. The spelling, if I remember correctly, is mine, but the text is exactly as written by Mark. I wrote asking his view of making the spelling of the period, and he was enthusiastic telling me to do whatever I thought best, and he was greatly pleased with the result. Thus was printed in a deluxe edition of fifty copies the most curious masterpiece of American humor. At one of America's most dignified institutions, the United States Military Academy at West Point. 1601 was so be praised by the archaeological scholars of a quarter of a century ago, wrote Clemens in his letter to Charles Orr, that I was rather inordinately vain of it. At that time it had been privately printed in several countries, among them Japan. A sumptuous edition on large paper, rough-edged, was made by loot. C.E.S. Wood at West Point an edition of fifty copies, and distributed among popes and kings and such people. In England copies of that issue were worth twenty guineas when I was there six years ago, and none to be had. From the Depths Mark Twain's irreverence should not be misinterpreted. It was an irreverence which bubbled up from a deep, passionate insight into the well-springs of human nature. In 1601, as in The Man That Corrupted Hadleyburg, and in The Mysterious Stranger, he tore the masks off human beings and left them cringing before the public view. With the diffness of a master surgeon, Clemens dealt with human emotions and delighted in exposing human nature in the raw. The spirit and the language of the fireside conversation were rooted deep in Mark Twain's nature and in his life. As C. E. S. Wood, who printed 1601 at West Point, has pertinently observed, if I made a guess as to the intellectual ferment out of which 1601 rose, I would say that Mark's intellectual structure 
and subconscious graining was from Anglo-Saxons as primitive as the common man of the Tudor period. He came from the banks of the Mississippi from the flatboatmen, pilots, roustabouts, farmers and village folk of a rude, primitive people as Lincoln did. He was finished in the mining camps of the West among stage drivers, gamblers and the men of 49. The simple roughness of a frontier people was in his blood and brain. Words vulgar and offensive to other ears were a common language to him. Anyone who ever knew Mark heard him use them freely, forcibly, picturesquely in his unrestrained conversation. Such language is forcible as all primitive words are. Refinement seems to make for weakness, or let us say a cutting edge, but the old vulgar monosyllabic words bit like the blow of a pioneer's axe, and Mark was like that. Then, I think 1601 came out of Mark's instinctive humor, satire, and hatred of Puritanism. But there is more than this. With all its humor, there is a sense of real delight in what may be called obscenity for its own sake. Whitman and the Bible are no more obscene than nature herself, no more obscene than a manure pile, out of which come roses and cherries. Every word used in 1601 was used by our own rude pioneers as a part of their vocabulary, and no word was ever invented by man with obscene intent, but only as language to express his meaning. No act of nature is obscene in itself, but when such words and acts are dragged in for an ulterior purpose they become offensive. As everything out of place is offensive, I think he delighted too, in shocking giving resounding slaps on what Chaucer would quite simply call the bare erse. Quite aside from this Chaucerian erse slapping, Clemens had also a semi-serious purpose, that of reproducing a past time as he saw it in Shakespeare. Decker, Johnson, and other writers of the Elizabethan era Fireside conversation was an exercise in scholarship illumined by a keen sense of character. It was made especially effective by the artistic arrangement of widely gathered material into a compressed picture of a phase of the manners and even the minds of the men and women in the spacious times of great Elizabeth. Mark Twain made of 1601 a very smart and fascinating performance carried over almost to grotesqueness just to show it was not done for mere delight in the frank naturalism of the functions with which it deals. That Mark Twain had made considerable study of this frankness is apparent from Chapter 4 of A Yankee at King Arthur's Court, where he refers to the conversation at the famous round table thus. Many of the terms used in the most matter-of-fact way by this great assemblage of the first ladies and gentlemen of the land would have made a Comanche blush. Indelicacy is too mild a term to convey the idea, however, I had read Tom Jones and Roderick Random, and other books of that kind, and knew that the highest and first ladies and gentlemen in England had remained little or no cleaner in their talk and in the morals and conduct which such talk implies, clear up to one hundred years ago. In fact, clear into our own nineteenth century in which century, broadly speaking, 
the earliest samples of the real lady and the real gentleman discoverable in English history or in European history, for that matter may be said to have made their appearance. Suppose Sir Walter, instead of putting the conversation into the mouths of his characters, had allowed the characters to speak for themselves. We should have had talk from Rebecca and Ivanhoe and the soft lady Rowena, which would embarrass a tramp in our day. However, to the unconsciously indelicate, all things are delicate. Mark Twain's interest in history and in the depiction of historical periods and characters is revealed through his fondness for historical reading in preference to fiction and through his other historical writings. Even in the hilarious, youthful days in San Francisco, Payne reports that Clemens, however, was never quite ready for sleep. Then, as ever, he would prop himself up in bed light his pipe, and lose himself in English or French history until his sleep conquered. Payne tells us, too, that Lecky's European morals was an old favorite. The notes to the prince and the pauper show again how carefully Clemens examined his historical background and his interest in these materials. Some of the more important sources are noted. Hume's History of England, Tim's Curiosities of London, J. Hammond Trumbull's Blue Laws, True and False. Apparently Mark Twain relished it, for, as Bernard Devoto points out, the book is always Mark Twain. Its parodies of Tudor speech lapse sometimes into a callow satisfaction in that idiom Mark hugely enjoys his nathlesses and beshrews and marries. The writing of 1601 foreshadows his fondness for this treatment. Do you suppose the liberties and the broad of these states have to do only with delicate lady words, with gloved gentleman words Walt Whitman? An American primer, although 1601 was not matched by any similar sketch in his published works, it was representative of Mark Twain the man. He was no emaciated literary tea tosser, bronzed and weather beaten son of the West, Mark was a man's man. And that significant fact is emphasized by the several phases of Mark's rich life as steamboat pilot, printer, minor and frontier journalist. On the Virginia City Enterprise Mark learned from editor R. M. Daggett that when it was necessary to call a man names, there were no expletives too long or too expressive to be hurled in rapid succession, to emphasize the utter want of character of the man assailed. There were typesetters there who could hurl anathemas at bad copy, which would have frightened a Bengal tiger. The news editor could damn a mutilated dispatch in 24 languages. In San Francisco in the sizzling 60s, we catch a glimpse of Mark Twain and his buddy, Steve Gillies. Pausing in doorways to sing the doleful ballad of the neglected lover, an old piece of uncollected erotica. One morning, when a dog began to howl, Steve awoke to find his roommate standing in the door that opened out into a back garden. Holding a big revolver, his hand shaking with cold and excitement, relates pain in his biography. Come here, Steve, he said. I am so chilled through I can't get a beat on him. Sam, said Steve, should not shoot him. Just swear at him. You can easily kill him at any range with your profanity. Steve Gillies declares that Mark Twain let go such a scorching, 
singeing blast that the brute's owner sold him the next day for a Mexican hairless dog. Nor did Mark's geysers of profanity cease spouting after these gay and youthful days in San Francisco. With Clemens it may truly be said that profanity was an art, a pyrotechnic art, that entertained nations. It was my duty to keep buttons on his shirts, recalled Katie Leary, lifelong housekeeper and friend in the Clemens Manage. And he should swear something terrible if I didn't. If he found a shirt in his drawer without a button on, he should take every single shirt out of that drawer and throw them right out of the window, rain or shine out of the bathroom window they should go. I used to look out every morning to see the snowflakes anything white. Out they should fly, oh, he should swear at anything when he was on a rampage. He should swear at his razor if it didn't cut right, and Mrs. Clemens used to send me around to the bathroom door sometimes to knock and ask him what was the matter. Well, I should go and knock. I should say, Mrs. Clemens wants to know what's the matter. And then, he should say to me kind of low in a whisper like, Did she hear me, Katie? Yes, I should say. Every word. Oh, well, he was ashamed then. He was afraid of getting scolded for swearing like that, because Mrs. Clemens hated swearing. But his swearing never seemed really bad to Katie Leary. It was sort of funny, and a part of him, somehow. She said, sort of amusing it was, and gay not like real swearing, cause he swore like an angel. In his later years at Stormfield, Mark loved to play his favorite billiards. It was sometimes a wonderful and fearsome thing to watch Mr. Clemens play billiards, relates Elizabeth Wallace. He loved the game, and he loved to win, but he occasionally made a very bad stroke, and then the varied. Picturesque and unorthodox vocabulary, acquired in his more youthful years, was the only thing that gave him comfort. Gently, slowly, with no profane inflections of voice, but irresistibly as though they had the headwaters of the Mississippi for their source, came this stream of unholy adjectives and choice expletives. Mark's vocabulary ran the whole gamut of life itself. In Paris, in his appearance in 1879 before the Stomach Club, a jolly lot of gay wags, Mark's address, reports pain. Obtained a wide celebrity among the clubs of the world, though no line of it, not even its title, has ever found its way into published literature. It is rumored to have been called some remarks on the science of onanism. In Berlin, Mark asked Henry W. Fisher to accompany him on an exploration of the Berlin Royal Library, where the librarian, having learned that Clemens had been the Kaiser's guest at dinner, opened the secret treasure chests for the famous visitor. One of these guarded treasures was a volume of grossly indecent verses by Voltaire, addressed to Frederick the Great. Too much is enough, Mark is reported to have said, when Fisher translated some of the verses, I would blush to remember any of these stanzas except to tell Kraft Ebbing about them when I get to Vienna. When Fisher had finished copying a verse for him, Mark put it into his pocket, saying, Livy is so busy mispronouncing German these days, she can't even attempt to get at this. In his letters, too, Howells observed, he had the southwestern, the Lincolnian, the Elizabethan breadth of parlance. 
which I suppose one ought not to call coarse without calling one's self prudish, and I was often hiding away in discreet holes and corners the letters in which he had loosed his bold fancy to stoop on rank suggestion. I could not bear to burn them, and I could not, after the first reading, quite bear to look at them. I shall best give my feeling on this point by saying that in it he was Shakespearean. With a nigger squat on her safety valve, John Hay, Pike County Ballads. Is there any other explanation? asks Van Wyck Brooks of his Elizabethan breadth of parlance. Mr. Howells confesses that he sometimes blushed over Mark Twain's letters. That there were some which, to the very day when he wrote his eulogy on his dead friend, he could not bear to reread. Perhaps if he had not so insisted, in former years, while going over Mark Twain's proofs, upon having that swearing out in an instant, he would never have had cause to suffer from his having loosed his bold fancy to stoop on rank suggestion. Mark Twain's verbal Rabelainism was obviously the expression of that vital sap which, not having been permitted to inform his work, had been driven inward and left there to ferment. No wonder he was always indulging in orgies of forbidden words. Consider the famous book, 1601, that fireside conversation in the time of Queen Elizabeth. Is there any obsolete verbal indecency in the English language that Mark Twain has not painstakingly resurrected and assembled there? He, whose blood was in constant ferment, and who could not contain within the narrow bonds that had been set for him the roitous exuberance of his nature had to have an escape valve, and he poured through it a fetid stream of meaningless obscenity the waste of a priceless psychic material. Thus, Brooks lumps 1601 with Mark Twain's Baudry, and interprets it simply as another indication of frustration. Figs for fig leaves. Of course, the writing of such a piece as 1601 raised the question of freedom of expression for the creative artist. Although little discussed at that time, it was a question which intensely interested Mark, and for a fuller appreciation of Mark's position, one must keep in mind the year in which 1601 was written. 1876 there had been nothing like it before in American literature. There had appeared no Caldwells, no Faulkners, no Hemingways. Victorian England was gushing Tennyson. In the United States, polite letters was a cult of the Brahmins of Boston, with William Dean Howells at the helm of the Atlantic. Louisa May Alcott published Little Women in 1868-69 and Little Men in 1871. In 1873, Mark Twain led the van of the debunkers, scraping the gilt off the lily in the Gilded Age. In 1880, Mark took a few pot shots at license in art and literature in his tramp abroad. I wonder why some things are, for instance. Art is allowed as much indecent license today as in earlier times, but the privileges of literature in this respect have been sharply curtailed within the past 80 or 90 years. Fielding and Smollett could portray the beastliness of their day in the beastliest language. We have plenty of foul subjects to deal with in our day, but we are not allowed to approach them very near. Even with nice and guarded forms of speech, but not so with art. The brush may still deal freely with any subject, however revolting or indelicate. It makes a body ooze sarcasm at every pore to go about Rome and Florence 
and see what this last generation has been doing with the statues. These works, which had stood in innocent nakedness for ages, are all fig-leaved now. Yes, every one of them. Nobody noticed their nakedness before, perhaps nobody can help noticing it now. The fig leaf makes it so conspicuous. But the comical thing about it all is that the fig leaf is confined to cold and pallid marble, which would be still cold and unsuggestive without this sham and ostentatious symbol of modesty, whereas warm-blooded paintings which do really need it have in no case been furnished with it. At the door of the Euphysi in Florence, one is confronted by statues of a man and a woman, noseless, battered. Black with accumulated grime, they hardly suggest human beings, yet these ridiculous creatures have been thoughtfully and conscientiously fig-leaved by this fastidious generation. You enter and proceed to that most visited little gallery that exists in the world, and there, against the wall, without obstructing rag or leaf, you may look your fill upon the foulest. The vilest, the obscenest picture the world possesses Titian's Venus. It isn't that she is naked and stretched out on a bed, no, it is the attitude of one of her arms and hand. If I ventured to describe the attitude, there would be a fine howl, but there the Venus lies, for anybody to gloat over that wants to, and there she has a right to lie. For she is a work of art, and art has its privileges. I saw young girls stealing furtive glances at her. I saw young men gaze long and absorbedly at her. I saw aged. Infirm men hang upon her charms with a pathetic interest. How I should like to describe her just to see what a holy indignation I could stir up in the world just to hear the unreflecting average man deliver himself about my grossness and coarseness. And all that, in every gallery in Europe, there are hideous pictures of blood, carnage, oozing brains, Putrefaction pictures portraying intolerable suffering pictures alive with every conceivable horror. Wrought out in dreadful detail and similar pictures are being put on the canvas every day and publicly exhibited without a growl from anybody for they are innocent. They are inoffensive being works of art. But suppose a literary artist ventured to go into a painstaking and elaborate description of one of these grisly things the critics would skin him alive. Well, let it go. It cannot be helped. Art retains her privileges. Literature has lost hers. Somebody else may cipher out the whys and the wherefores and the consistencies of it. I haven't got time. Professor Sense Pornography, unfortunately, 1601 has recently been tagged by Professor Edward Wagenknecht as the most famous piece of pornography in American literature. Like many another uninformed, Prof. W. is like the little boy who is shocked to see naughty words chalked on the back fence and thinks they are pornography the initiated, after years of wading through the mire, will recognize instantly the significant difference between filthy filth and funny filth. Dirt for dirt's sake is something else again. Pornography, an eminent American jurist has pointed out. The words which are criticized as dirty, observed Justice John M. We'll see in the United States District Court of New York, lifting the ban on Ulysses by James Joyce, are old Saxon words known to almost all men, and I venture to many women, 
and are such words as would be naturally and habitually used, I believe, by the types of folk whose life, physical and mental, Joyce is seeking to describe. Neither was their pornographic intent, according to Justice Woolsey. Nor was Ulysses obscene within the legal definition of that word. The meaning of the word obscene, the justice indicated, as legally defined by the courts, is tending to stir the sex impulses or to lead to sexually impure and lustful thoughts. Whether a particular book would tend to excite such impulses and thoughts must be tested by the court's opinion as to its effect on a person with average sex instincts, what the French would call long moyenne sensual who plays. In this branch of legal inquiry, the same role of hypothetical reagent as does the aerosonable man in the law of torts and the learned man in the art on questions of invention in patent law. Obviously, it is ridiculous to say that the leer of the sensualist lurks in the pages of Mark Twain's 1601. Droll story. In a way, observed William Marion Reedy, 1601 is to Twain's whole works what the droll stories are to Balzac's. It is better than the privately circulated ribaldry and vulgarity of Eugene Field is, indeed, an essay in a sort of primordial humor such as we find in Rayblay or in the plays of some of the lesser stars that drew their light from Shakespeare's urn. It is humor or fun such as one expects, let us say, from the peasants of Thomas Hardy, outside of Hardy's books. And, though it be filthy, it yet hath a splendor of mere animalism of good spirits. I would say it is scatological rather than erotic, save for one touch toward the end. Indeed, it seems more of Rayblay than of Boccaccio or Massaccio or Aretino is brutally British rather than lasciviously Latinate. As to the subjects, but sumptuous as regards the language, Immediately upon first reading, John Hay, later Secretary of State, had proclaimed 1601 a masterpiece. Albert Bigelow Payne, Mark Twain's biographer, likewise acknowledged its greatness when he said, 1601 is a genuine classic. As classics of that sort go, it is better than the gross obscenities of Rayleigh, and perhaps in some day to come. The taste that justified Gargantua and the Decameron will give this literary refugee shelter and setting among the more conventional writing of Mark Twain. Human taste is a curious thing. Delicacy is purely a matter of environment and point of view. It depends on who writes a thing whether it is coarse or not, wrote Clemens in his notebook in 1879. I built a conversation which could have happened. I used words such as were used at that time, 1601. I sent it anonymously to a magazine, and how the editor abused it and the sender. But that man was a praiser of Rayblay and had been saying, Oh, that we had a Rayblay, I judged that I could furnish him one. Then I took it to one of the greatest, best, and most learned of divines and read it to him. He came within an ace of killing himself with laughter, for between you and me the thing was dreadfully funny. I don't often write anything that I laugh at myself, but I can hardly think of that thing without laughing. That old divine said it was a piece of the finest kind of literary art, and David Gray of the Buffalo Courier said it ought to be printed privately and left behind me when I died. And then my fame as a literary artist would last, Franklin J., Maine, 
The first printing verbatim reprint, Conversation as IT was by the social fireside, in the time of the Tudors. Yesternight took her maestie queen a fantasy such as she sometimes hath, and had to her closet certain that do write plays, books, and such like. These being my Lord Bacon, his worship Sir Walter Raleigh, Mr. Ben Johnson, and ye child Francis Beaumont, which being but sixteen, hath yet turned his hand to ye doing of ye Latin masters into our English tongue. With great discretion and much applause, also came with these ye famous Shakespeare, a right strong mixing truly of mighty blowed with mean, ye more in especial since ye queen's grace was present. As likewise these following, to wit, ye Duchess of Bilgewater, twenty-two years of age, ye Countess of Granby, twenty-six her daughter, ye Lady Helen, fifteen, as also these two maids of honour. To wit, ye Lady Marjorie Boothie, sixty-five, and ye Lady Alice Dilbury, turned seventy, she being two years, ye Queen's Grace's elder. I being her mate's cup-bearer, had no choice but to remain and behold rank forgot, and ye high hold converse wh ye low as up in equal terms. A great scandal did ye world hear thereof. In ye heat of ye talk it befell it one did break wind, yielding an exceeding mighty and distressful stink. Whereat all did laugh full sore, and then, Ye Queen, verily in mine eight and sixty years have I not heard the fellow to this fart. Messemith, by ye great sound and clamour of it, it was male, yet ye belly it did lurk behind should a now fall lean and flat against ye spine of him it hath been delivered of so stately and so waste of bulk. Whereas ye guts of them it do quiff splitters bear, stand comely still and round. Prithee let ye author confess ye offspring, will my Lady Alice testify. Lady Alice, good your grace, and I had room for such a thundergust within mine ancient bowels, tis not in reason I could a discharge ye same and live to thank God, for if he did choose handmaid so humble whereby to show his power. Nay, tis not I it have brought forth this rich o'ermastering fog. Ye queen, may happy Lady Marjorie hath done ye company this favour. Lady Marjorie, so please you, madam, my limbs are feeble w-h-e weight and drouth of five and sixty winters. And it behoveth it I be tender unto them, in ye good providence of God, and I had contained this wonder. Forsooth wold I have jean ye whole evening of my sinking life, to ye dribbling of it forth, with trembling and uneasy soul. Not launched it sudden in its matchless might, taking mine own life with violence, rending my weak frame like rotten rags. It was not I, your maesty ye queen. O God's name, who hath favoured us, hath it come to pass it a fart shall fart itself, not such a one as this. I trow, young master Beaumont, but no, too old have wafted him to heaven like down of goose's body. Twas not ye little lady Helen, nay, near blush, my child, thult tickle thy tender maiden head with many a mousy squeak before thou learnest to blow a hurricane like this. Wasn't you, my learned and ingenious Johnson? Johnson, so fell a blast hath near mine ears saluted, nor yet a stench so all-pervading and immortal. Twas not a novice did it, good your maesty, 
but one of veteran experience else had he failed of confidence. In sooth it was not I, ye queen, my Lord Bacon. Lord Bacon? Not from my lean entrails hath this prodigy burst forth, so please your grace. Not doth so befit ye Gret as Gret performance, and haply shall ye find it tis not from mediocrity, this miracle hath issued. Ye Queen, what saith ye worshipful Master Shakespeare? Shakespeare, in the great hand of God I stand, and so proclaim mine innocence. Though ye sinless hosts of heaven had foretold ye coming of this most desolating breath, proclaiming it a work of uninspired man. Its quaking thunders, its firmament-clogging rottenness his own achievement in due course of nature, yet had not I believed it, but had said the pit itself hath furnished forth the stink, and heaven's artillery hath shook the globe in admiration of it. S.R.W., most gracious Maisty, t'was I that did it, but indeed it was so poor and frail a note, compared with such as I am wont to furnish. It in sooth I was ashamed to call the weakling mine in so august a presence. It was nothing less than nothing, madam I did it but to clear my nether throat, but had I come prepared. Then, had I delivered something worthy, bear with me, please your grace till I can make amends. Then, fell they to talk about ye manners and customs of many peoples, and Master Shakespeare spake of ye bulk of ye seer Michael de Montaigne, wherein was mention of ye custom of widows of Perigord to wear up in ye headdress, in sign of widowhood, a jewel in ye similitude of a man's member wilted and limber, whereat ye queen did laugh, and say widows in England do wear pricks too. But betwixt the thighs, and not wilted neither, till coition hath done that office for them. Master Shakespeare did likewise observe how it ye seer de Montaigne hath also spoken of a certain emperor of such mighty prowess, that he did take ten maiden heads in ye compass of a single night. Ye while his impress did entertain two and twenty lusty knights between her sheets, yet was not satisfied. Whereat ye merry Countess Granby saith a ram is yet ye emperor's superior, sith he will top above a hundred ewes twixt son and son. And after, if he can have none more to shag, will masturbate, until he hath enriched should whole acres with his seed. Then spake ye damned windmill, S.R. Walter, of a people in ye uttermost parts of America, it capulate not, until they be five and thirty years of age. Ye women being eight and twenty, and do it then but once in seven years, Ye queen, how doth that like my little lady Helen? Shall we send thee thither, and preserve thy belly? Lady Helen, please your highness's grace, mine old nurse hath told me there are more ways of serving God than by locking the thighs together. Yet am I willing to serve him at way too, sith your highness's grace hath set ye an sample. Ye Queen, God wounds a good answer, child of Lady Alice. Mayhap twill weaken when ye hair sprouts below ye navel. Lady Helen, nay, it sprouted two years sign, I can scarce more than cover it with my hand now. Ye Queen, hear ye that my little Beaumont, have ye not a little bird about ye, that stirs at hearing tell of so sweet a nest. Beaumont, tis not insensible, illustrious madam, 
but mousing owls and bats of low degree may not aspire to bliss so whelming and ecstatic as is found in ye downy nests of birds of paradise. Ye queen, by ye gullet of God, tis a neat turned compliment. With such a tongue as thine, lad, fold spread the ivory thighs of many a willing maid in thy good time. And thy codpiece be as handy as thy speech. Then spake ye queen of how she met old Rayblay when she was turned of fifteen. And he did tell her of a man his father knew that had a double pair of bollocks, whereon a controversy followed as concerning the most just way to spell the word. Ye contention running high betwixt ye learned Bacon and ye ingenious Johnson, until at last ye old lady Marjorie, wearying of it all, saith gentles, what mattereth it how ye shall spell the word? I warrant ye when ye use your bollocks ye shall not think of it. And my lady Granby, be ye content, let the spelling be, ye shall enjoy the beating of them on your buttocks just the same. I trow, before I had gained my fourteenth year I had learnt that them that would explore a cunt stop should not to consider the spelling ought. SRW ensued, when a shift's turned up, delay is meet for naught but dalliance, the Caxio hath a story of a priest that did beguile a maid into his cell, then knelt him in a corner to pray for grace to be rightly thankful for this tender maidenhead ye lord had sent him. But ye abbot, spying through ye keyhole, did see a tuft of brownish hair, with fair white flesh about it. Wherefore when ye priest's prayer was done, his chance was gone. For as much as ye little maid had but ye one cunt, and that was already occupied to her content, then conversed they of religion, and ye mighty work ye old dead Luther did do by ye grace of God. And next about poetry, and Master Shakespeare did redare a part of his King Henry Roman four. Ye which, it seemeth unto me, is not of ye value of an arseful of ashes. Yet they praised it bravely. One and all, ye same did redair a portion of his Venus and Adonis, to their prodigious admiration, whereas I, being sleepy and fatigued withal, did deem it but paltry stuff, and was the more discomforted, in that ye bloaty buccaneer had got his wind again, and did turn his mind to farting with such villain zeal, that presently I was like to choke once more. God damn, this windy ruffian and all his breed! I wold that hell might get him. They talked about ye wonderful defence which old Essar, Nicholas Throgmorton did make for himself before ye judges in ye time of Mary, which was unlucky matter to broach. Sith it fetched out ye queen with a pity at he, having so much wit, had yet not enough to save his daughter's maidenhead sound for her marriage bed. And ye queen did give ye damn should Essar, Walter a look it made him wince for she hath not forgot, he was her own lover, it it old day. There was silent uncomfortableness now, twas not a good turn for talk to take, sith if ye queen must find offence in a little harmless debauching. When pricks were stiff and cunts not loath to take ye stiffness out of them, who of this company was sinless? Behold! Was not ye wife of Master Shaxpur four months gone with child when she stood up before ye altar? Was not her grace of Biljuator Roger should by four lords before she had a husband? Was not ye little lady Helen born on her mother's wedding day? And behold, were not ye lady Alice and ye lady Marjorie there? 
mouthing religion, pours from ye cradle. In time came they to discourse of Cervantes, and of the new painter, Rubens, that is beginning to be heard of. Fine words and dainty wrought phrases from the ladies now, one or two of them being, in other days, pupils of that poor ass. Lil, himself, and I marked how that Johnson and Shaxpur did fidget to discharge some venom of sarcasm. Yet dared they not in the presence, the Queen's grace being ye very flower of ye euphuists herself. But behold, these be they it, having a specialty, and admiring it in themselves, be jealous when a neighbor doth essay it. Nor can abide it in them long, wherefore twas observable it ye queen waxed uncontent. And in time labor should grandiose speech out of ye mouth of Lady Alice, who manifestly did mightily pride herself thereon. Did quite exhaust ye queen's endurance, who listened till ye gaudy speech was done, then lifted up her brows, and with vast irony, mincing saith, O oh shit, whereat they alle did laugh, but not ye Lady Alice, it old foolish bitch. Now was Essar, Walter minded of a tale he once did hear ye ingenious Margaret of Navarre relate, about a maid, which being like to suffer rape by an old archbishop, did smartly contrive a device to save her maiden head and said to him, First, my lord, I prithee, take out thy holy tool and piss before me. Which doing, lo, his member fell, and would not rise again. Footnotes to Frivolity The historical consistency of 1601 indicates that Twain must have given the subject considerable thought. The author was careful to speak only of men who conceivably might have been in the Virgin Queen's closet and engaged in discourse with her. The Characters At this time, 1601, Queen Elizabeth was 68 years old. She speaks of having talked to old Rabelais in her youth. This might have been possible as Rabelais died in 1552, when the Queen was 19 years old. Among those in the party were Shakespeare, at that time 37 years old, Ben Jonson, 27, and Sir Walter Raleigh, 49. Beaumont at the time was 17, not 16. He was admitted as a member of the Inner Temple in 1600, and his first translations, those from Ovid, were first published in 1602. Therefore, if one were holding strictly to the year date, neither by age nor by fame would Beaumont have been eligible to attend such a gathering of August personages in the year 1601. But the point is unimportant. The Elizabethan writers. In the conversation Shakespeare speaks of Mantegna's essays. These were first published in 1580 and successive editions were issued in the years following, the third volume being published in 1588. In England Mantegna was early popular. It was long supposed that the autograph of Shakespeare in a copy of Florio's translation showed his study of the essays. The autograph has been disputed, but divers passages, and especially one in The Tempest, show that at first or second hand the poet was acquainted with the essayist. Encyclopedia Britannica the company at the Queen's fireside discoursed of Lily or Lily, English dramatist and novelist of the Elizabethan era, whose novel, Euphues, published in two parts, Euphues, 
or the anatomy of wit 1579 and euphues and his england 1580 was a literary sensation it is said to have influenced literary style for more than a quarter of a century and traces of its influence are found in shakespeare columbia encyclopedia the introduction of ben johnson into the party was wholly appropriate if one may call to witness some of Johnson's writings. The subject under discussion was one that Johnson was acquainted with in The Alchemist. Act. I seen I, face believe it I will, subtle thy worst. I fart at thee, dull common, have you your wits, why, gentlemen, for love? Act. Two, seen I, Sir Epicure Mammon, and then my poets, the same that writ so subtly of the fart, whom I shall entertain still for that subject and again in Bartholomew Fair. Nightingale sings a ballad here for your love, and by for your money. A delicate ballad, O oh, the ferret and the canaille, a preservative again, the punk's evil. Another goose green starch, and the devil, a dozen of divine points, and the godly garter, the fairing of good counsel. Of an ell and three quarters, what is to you by, the windmill blown down by the witch's fart, or St. George? That, oh, did break the dragon's heart, good old English custom that certain types of English society have not changed materially in their freedom toward breaking wind in public can be noticed in some comparatively recent literature. Frank Harris in My Life, Vol. 2, C.H. Roman 13, tells of Lady Marriott, wife of a judge advocate general, being compelled to leave her own table at which she was entertaining Sir Robert Fowler, then the Lord Mayor of London, because of the suffocating and nauseating odours there. He also tells of an instance in Parliament, and of a rather brilliant bon mot spoken upon that occasion. While Fowler was speaking, Finch Hatton had shewn signs of restlessness, Towards the end of the speech he had moved some three yards away from the baronet. As soon as Fowler sat down, Finch Hatton sprang up holding his handkerchief to his nose. Mr. Speaker, he began, and was at once acknowledged by the Speaker, for it was a maiden speech, and as such was entitled to precedence by the courteous custom of the House. I know why the right honorable member from the city did not conclude his speech with a proposal. The only way to conclude such a speech appropriately would be with a motion. Eolian crepitations. But society had apparently degenerated sadly in modern times, and even in the era of Elizabeth. For, at an earlier date, it was a serious nay capital offense to break wind in the presence of majesty. The Emperor Claudius, hearing that one who had suppressed the urge while paying him court had suffered greatly thereby, intended to issue an edict, allowing to all people the liberty of giving vent at table to any distension occasioned by flatulence. Marshall, 2 Book Roman 12, Epigram LXXVI tells of the embarrassment of one who broke wind while praying in the capital. One day, while standing upright, addressing his prayers to Jupiter, Ethan farted in the capital. Men laughed, but the father of the gods, offended, condemned the guilty one to dine at home for three nights. Since that time, Miserable Ethan, when he wishes to enter the capital, goes first to Patercleus Privies and farts ten or twenty times. Yet, 
In spite of this precautionary crepitation, he salutes Jove with constricted buttocks. Marshall also book Roman IV, epigram LXXX, ridicules a woman who was subject to the habit, saying, Your bassa fabulous has always a child at her side, calling it her darling and her plaything. And yet more wonder she does not care for children. What is the reason, then? Bassa is apt to fart, for which she could blame the unsuspecting infant. The tale is told, too, of a certain woman who performed an Aeolian crepitation at a dinner attended by the witty Monsignor Duke and Loop, Bishop of Orleans, and that when, to cover up her lapse, she began to scrape her feet upon the floor and to make similar noises. The bishop said, Do not trouble to find a rhyme, madam. Nay, worthier names than those of any yet mentioned have discussed the matter. Herodotus tells of one such which was the precursor to the fall of an empire and a change of dynasty, that which Amasis discharges while on horseback, and bids the envoy of a prize, king of Egypt, catch and deliver to his royal master. Even the exact manner and posture of Amasis, author of this insult, is described. St. Augustine, the City of God, Roman 14, 24, cites the instance of a man who could command his rear trumpet to sound at will which his learned commentator fortifies with the example of one who could do so in tune. Benjamin Franklin, in his letter to the Royal Academy of Brussels, has canvassed suggested remedies for alleviating the stench attendant upon these discharges. My prize question, therefore, should be to discover some drug, wholesome and not disagreeable, to be mixed with our common food, or sauces that shall render the natural discharges of wind from our bodies not only inoffensive, but agreeable as perfumes. That this is not a chimerical project and altogether impossible may appear from these considerations that we already have some knowledge of means capable of varying that smell he that dines on stale flesh, especially with much addition of onions, shall be able to afford a stink that no company can tolerate. While he that has lived for some time on vegetables only, shall have that breath so pure as to be insensible of the most delicate noses. And if he can manage so as to avoid the report, he may anywhere give vent to his griefs, unnoticed. But as there are many to whom an entire vegetable diet would be inconvenient, and as a little quick lime thrown into a jakes will correct the amazing quantity of fetid air arising from the vast mass of putrid matter contained in such places, and render it pleasing to the smell, who knows but that a little powder of lime or some other equivalent taken in our food or perhaps a glass of lime water drank at dinner, may have the same effect on the air produced in and issuing from our bowels. One curious commentary on the text is that Elizabeth should be so fond of investigating into the authorship of the exhalation in question. When she was inordinately fond of strong and sweet perfumes, in fact, she was responsible for the tremendous increase in importations of scents into England during her reign. E. Boke of E. Seer Michael de Montaigne. There is a curious admixture of error and misunderstanding in this part of the sketch. In the first place, the story is borrowed from Montaigne, where it is told inaccurately, 
and then further corrupted in the telling. It was not the good widows of Paragord who wore the phallus upon their coifs. It was the young married women of the district near Mantani's home, who paraded it to view upon their foreheads as a symbol, says our essayist, of the joy they derived therefrom. If they became widows, they reversed its position and covered it up with the rest of their headdress. The emperor mentioned was not an emperor. He was Procolus, a native of Album, on the Genos coast, who, with Bonossus, led the unsuccessful rebellion in Gaul against Emperor Probus. Even so keen a commentator as Cotton has failed to note the error. The Empress Mantani does not say his Empress was Messalina, third wife of the Emperor Claudius, who was uncle of Caligula and foster father to Nero. Furthermore, in her case the charge is that she copulated with twenty-five in a single night, and not twenty-two. As appears in the text, Mantani is right in his statistics if original sources are correct, whereas the author erred in transcribing the incident. As for Proculus, it has been noted that he was associated with Bonossus, who was as renowned in the field of Bacchus as was Proculus in that of Venus Gibbon. Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire the feat of Proculus is told in his own words, in Vopiscus, Hist. Augustine, p. 246, where he recounts having captured 100 Sarmatian virgins, and unmaidened ten of them in one night, together with the happenings subsequent thereto concerning Messalina, there appears to be no question but that she was a nymphomaniac, and that, while Empress of Rome, she participated in some fearful debaucheries. The question is what to believe, for much that we have heard about her is almost certainly apocryphal. The author from whom Mantani took his facts is the elder Pliny, who in his Natural History, Book X, Chapter 83, says, other animals become sated with veneral pleasures. Man hardly knows any satiety. Messalina, the wife of Claudius Caesar, thinking this a palm quite worthy of an empress, selected for the purpose of deciding the question. One of the most notorious women who followed the profession of a hired prostitute, and the empress outdid her, after continuous intercourse, night and day, at the twenty-fifth embrace. But Pliny, notwithstanding his great attainments, was often a retailer of stale gossip, and in like case was Aurelius Victor. Another writer who heaped much odium on her name. Again, there is a great hiatus in the annals of Tacitus, a true historian, at the period covering the earlier days of the Empress, while Suetonius, bitter as he may be, is little more than an anecdotist. Juvenal, another of her detractors, is a prejudiced witness, for he started out to satirize female vice, and naturally aimed at high places. Dio also tells of Messalina's misdeeds, but his work is under the same limitations as that of Suetonius. Furthermore, none but Pliny mentions the excess under consideration. However, where there is much smoke there must be a little fire, and based upon the superimposed testimony of the writers of the period, there appears little doubt but that Messalina was a nymphomaniac, that she prostituted herself in the public stews, naked and with gilded nipples, and that she did actually marry her chief adulterer, 
Silius while Claudius was absent at Ostia, and that the wedding was consummated in the presence of a concourse of witnesses. This was the straw that broke the camel's back. Claudius hastened back to Rome. Silius was dispatched, and Messalina, lacking the willpower to destroy herself, was killed when an officer ran a sword through her abdomen. Just as it appeared that Claudius was about to relent, and spake he damned windmill, Sir Walter, Raleigh is thoroughly in character here. This observation is quite in keeping with the general veracity of his account of his travels in Guiana. One of the most mendacious accounts of adventure ever told. Naturally, the scholarly researches of Western Mark have failed to discover this people. Perhaps Lady Helen might best be protected among the Jibaros of Ecuador, where the men marry when approaching forty. N. Johnson in his conversations observed that S.R.W. Rawley esteemed more of fame than of conscience, ye virgin queen. Grave historians have debated for centuries the pretensions of Elizabeth to the title, the virgin queen. And it is utterly impossible to dispose of the issue in a note. However, the weight of opinion appears to be in the negative. Many and great were the difficulties attending the marriage of a Protestant princess in those troublous times. And Elizabeth finally announced that she would become wedded to the English nation, and she wore a ring in token thereof until her death. However, more or less open liaisons with Essex and Leicester, as well as a host of lesser courtiers, her ardent temperament, and her imperious temper are indications that cannot be denied in determining any estimate upon the point in question. N. Johnson in his conversations with William Drummond of Hawthornden says, Queen Elizabeth never saw herself after she became old in a true glass. They painted her and sometimes would vermily in her nose. She had always about Christmas evens set dice that threw sixes or five, and she knew not they were other. To make her win and esteem herself fortunate, that she had a membrana on her, which made her incapable of man. Though for her delight she tried many, at the coming over of Monsieur, there was a French chirurgeon who took in hand to cut it. Yet fear stayed her and his death. H. Fisher, whom Mark employed to nose up everything pertaining to Queen Elizabeth's manly character. Picaxio hath a story. The author does not pay any great compliment to Raleigh's memory here. There is no such tale in all Picaxio. The nearest related incident forms the subject matter of Dinio's novel, The Fourth of the First Day of the Decameron. Old Essar, Nicholas Throgmorton. The incident referred to appears to be Sir Nicholas Throgmorton's trial for complicity in the attempt to make Lady Jane Grey Queen of England, a charge of which he was acquitted. This so angered Queen Mary that she imprisoned him in the tower, and fined the jurors from one to two thousand pounds each. Her action terrified succeeding juries, so that Sir Nicholas' brother was condemned on no stronger evidence than that which had failed to prevail before. While Sir Nicholas' defense may have been brilliant, it must be admitted that the evidence was weak. He was later released from the tower, and under Elizabeth was one of a group of commissioners sent by that princess into Scotland. 
to foment trouble with Mary, Queen of Scots. When the attempt became known, Elizabeth repudiated the acts of her agents. But Sir Nicholas, having anticipated this possibility, had sufficient foresight to secure endorsement of his plan by the council. And so outwitted Elizabeth, who was playing a two-faced role, and Cecil, one of the greatest statesmen who ever held the post of principal minister. Perhaps it was this incident to which the company referred, which might in part explain Elizabeth's rejoinder. However, he had been restored to confidence ere this, and had served as ambassador to France to save his daughter's maiden head, Elizabeth Throckmorton or Throgmorton, daughter of Sir Nicholas, was one of Elizabeth's maids of honor. When it was learned that she had been debauched by Raleigh, Sir Walter was recalled from his command at sea by the Queen and compelled to marry the girl. This was not in that old day, as the text has it, for it happened only eight years before the date of this purported conversation. When Elizabeth was sixty years old. Partial Bibliography The various printings of 1601 reveal how Mark Twain's fireside conversation has become a part of the American printer's lore. But more important, its many printings indicate that it has become a popular bit of American folklore, particularly for men and women who have a feeling for Mark Twain. Apparently it appeals to the typographer who devotes to it his worthy art, as well as to the job printer, who may pull a crudely printed proof. The gay procession of curious printings of 1601 is unique in the history of American printing. Indeed, the story of the various printings of 1601 is almost legendary. In the days of the Jure, printer, so I am told, well-thumbed copies were carried from print shop to print shop. For more than a quarter century now, it has been one of the chief sources of enjoyment for printer's devils. And many a young rascal has learned about life from this fireside conversation. It has been printed all over the country, and if report is to be believed, in foreign countries as well. Because of the many surreptitious and anonymous printings, it is exceedingly difficult, if not impossible, to compile a complete bibliography. Many printings lack the name of the publisher, the printer, the place or date of printing. In many instances, some of the data, through the patient questioning of fellow collectors, has been obtained and supplied. 1. Conversation, as it was by the social fireside, in the time of the Tudors. Description, pamphlet, pp. 8, without wrappers or cover, measuring 7 8 inches. The title is set in caps, and small caps. The excessively rare first printing, printed in Cleveland, 1880. At the instance of Alexander Gunn, friend of John Hay, only four copies are believed to have been printed, of which it is said now the only known copy is located in the Willard S. Morse collection. 2. Date 1601. Conversation as it was by the social fireside in the time of the Tudors. Mem. The following is supposed to be an extract from the diary of the Peppies of that day, the same being cupbearer to Queen Elizabeth. It is supposed that he is of ancient and noble lineage, that he despises these literary canale, that his soul consumes with wrath to see the Queen stooping to talk with such, 
and that the old man feels his nobility defiled by contact with Shakespeare, etc., and yet he has got to stay there till Her Majesty chooses to dismiss him. Description, title as above, verso blank, pp Roman 11, text verso p. Roman 11 blank, about 8 x 10 inches, printed on handmade linen paper soaked in weak coffee, wrappers. The title is set in caps and small caps, call often, at the foot of P. Roman 11, done at Ye Academy Pref, MDCCC LXXX Roman 2, the privately printed West Point edition, the first printing of the text authorized by Mark Twain, of which but 50 copies were printed. The story of this printing is fully told in the introduction. 3. Conversation as it was by the social fireside in the time of the Tudors from ye diary of ye cupbearer to her maisty Queen Elizabeth. Imprinted by ye Puritan press at ye sign of ye jolly virgin 1601. Description. Two blank leaves. P blank P fronds. P. Title. P mem. PP1 text, I blank leaf, 43 slash 4 by 61 slash 4 inches, printed in a modern version of the Caxton black letter type. On MBM, French handmade paper, the frontispiece, a woodcut by A. E. Curtis is a portrait of the cup bearer, bound in buff gray boards, buckram back, Cover title reads, in pale red ink, Caxton type, conversation as it was by the social fireside in the time of the Tudors. Probably, the first published edition, later, in 1916, a facsimile edition of this printing was published in Chicago from plates, 